Last Sunday, June 26, my family and I left to go on vacation. At that point, Carolina had six recruits in the football class of 2023. By the time we got to Independence Day and I was getting settled back in, they had 14. That's right, Carolina added eight recruiting commits in nine days. What on earth? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, July 7th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making Locked On Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget that we're free and available anywhere you get podcasts. So go ahead right now, subscribe. For those of you who are watching, you can just hit the subscribe button, smash the like button, and leave a comment about your thoughts on some of these brand new football commits that Carolina has picked up. Would love to hear your thoughts on those. Well, joining me today to help unpack some of these commits is Sports Illustrated's Director of Football Recruiting, Mr. John Garcia Jr. Let's hop right into it. Man, so glad to have John Garcia joining us today to talk about Carolina football's recent recruiting haul over the past week and a half. SI's director of football recruiting. He's working on moving. That's why you see the empty shelves. John Garcia still take time out of his day to joining us. And beginning this week, all our John Garcia Jr. segments are brought to you by LinkedIn. We're getting you jobs, folks. So we'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Well, John, okay, we got to dive into this. Last uh, Sunday, June 26, my family and I leave to go to Mexico for a while. I come back uh, during Independence Day weekend, and when I left, Carolina had six commits in the class of 2023. Suddenly, they have 14 in the span of a week for a week. They got eight new commitments for this 2023 class. That is insane. Almost a commit a day. Uh, Both sides of the football, four stars, three stars, all sorts of stuff. So my question to you, John, is this. Why the recruiting run for the Tar Heels? Well, you know, not to throw uh, any Isaac shade on any of the other programs, but look, (laughs) this is something that's happening everywhere everybody's gone on some kind of a road now not yeah. not eight in seven days or whatever it is certainly not that many but i do think that there is a collective desire on both sides of the recruiting spectrum to push for decisions now the programs hmm. want these kids to claim spots so they can know where they stand do we have our quarterback what's our first position of need beyond that point how many spots are left relative to what is available among the uncommitted recruiting market. And then from the prospect perspective, it's the same deal. I want to claim my spot because it's limited. Unless you're a five-star All-American kind of guy, these spots are not always first come, first serve, but it's closer to that than not. So there is an urgency for these kids to get these decisions in, not only for recruiting purposes and, I guess, business purposes, but also for mental purposes. June Mm. was such a huge official visit month. Most of these kids that have committed took not only a North Carolina official, but two, three, four, even five official visits in the month of June. So these kids are exhausted. And now it's a dead (laughs) period and there's time. There's time to sit back and look into, hey, maybe I should, should pick one of these schools or I feel best about this school. And then you throw in a holiday weekend and July 4th has become this hey, I want to make my own fireworks kind of weekend. And all of that just kind of apexes towards a lot of verbal commitments. I think 200 kids in the FBS committed uh, from the last week of June into right where we are now in July. So in the last two weeks, like 200 kids have popped uh, at the FBS level. And a lot of these programs, again, are, are surging relative to what we expect for Carolina a lot of in-state recruits and a lot of regional recruits, three from Virginia, three more from Georgia in this class. Of course, the most uh, from North Carolina, five at this point. That is what we're seeing, a lot of regional recruits winding down uh, with the process and jumping in. And there's kind of a 
trickle down effect. You see your buddy do it and you're like, hey, I, I need to do it sometime soon as well. <laughs> so it, it's easier and more tangible when it's a lightning rod recruit that kind of serves as a catalyst, like Arch Manning picking Texas. You knew Texas Ooh. was going to go on a run, just kind of yes. obvious. Or yeah. another program getting their quarterback or their class headliner. But in this case, heavy regional play uh, and also a really good job of the staff accumulating great visits at the end of the month of June where it's a little bit more fresh and these kids have been ready to jump in soon after. Yeah, especially heading into that dead period, uh, then you know they can't go anywhere else. And so you have them and you're you're in their brain as the last one. Just um, for anybody who might be tuning in, listening or watching that isn't sure what all is defined by dead period, would you just explain to the to the people, John, what, what is entailed by in the dead period? Yeah, Isaac, the simplest way is that there's no in-person contact of any kind allowed. So it means you can't take a visit. The coach can't come visit you. Uh, he can't even go evaluate you if you're at a seven on seven or a camp or anything like that. It's totally digital or old school in terms of the recruiting. It's phone calls, it's FaceTimes, it's Twitter DMs, whatever, uh, Instagram, whatever method of communication digitally is allowed, but you cannot see either party. Either, either party can't see the other at this point. So it's, it's truly a dead period where we just see less movement in terms of schools moving up or down a kid's list but we do see a lot of decisions because june was wide open camps <laughs> official visits unofficial visits football events non-football events everybody tried to create something in the month of june so that fallout is still being felt because now it's a dead period and there's a whole lot of family vacation or sitting around or, or not a whole lot of uh, responsibility put on these kids right now in terms of football or school. So it's a lot of time to really figure this thing out. And of course it's summer, families around a little bit more. So your inner circle is a little bit more available compared to the spring or the fall. So it just kind of lines up for a lot of verbal commitments. And that's why we're seeing so many across the country. Yeah, love that. You you discussed, John, a little bit about what, what a crazy time the end of June, first weekend of July has become in terms of commitments. How does that factor in with transfer portal commitments? Are are, are schools holding spots? Are, are, you know, is any of that happening or is it just like you get what you can at the end of June and July and then you see what you can do later in the transfer portal? It's probably closer to your, your last point. You know, I, I do think, though, that if all things are even, I do think some schools are holding those spots. You know, we're going to see another run of transfer portal submissions here in August, right? Fall mm -hmm. camp is right around the corner. Position battles are going to be decided and kids are going to be mad. I mean, it's just part of the sport. Kids are going to be disgruntled uh, as, as far as where they stand. And then the whole other wave of, of freshmen are going to be on campus for the first time with live bullets and they're going to be like, Oh my God, this is a lot. This is a <laughs> lot at this school. I, I I'm homesick. I'm hurt, whatever it is. So there's going to be an influx of transfer portal submissions between the beginning of August and, and kickoff in that first week of September. So I do think a lot of programs are kind of just keeping <clears throat> things open if they can, if all things are even. Um, but some, some really aren't. I mean, I think, in the month of end of June into July, I think five, six, seven programs went above 20 verbal commitments. So there's wow. certainly not a lot of room at those programs for any transfer portal movement, uh, at least as things currently stand. So I do think that's still on people's mind. And we're, again, we're going to see an influx, but not as much as we see like in the spring when everybody, even yeah. starters and all Americans are moving around and, and making switches uh, via the portal. Man, that's great. Well, we're talking about all these commits that have just recently committed. I want to go back and actually talk about Caroline's first verbal commit for the class of 20, quarterback Tad Hudson. And we'll talk about him in just a moment, right after I tell you about Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models of cars, it's nearly impossible for your local auto parts store to stock everything you need. Why have to go through all the questions you don't know the answers to and then wait while the salesman tries to find the parts to order when instead you could just sit at home, get on rockauto.com and find the parts for yourself. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. 
That consistency is something that you can believe in. Rock Auto prices are reliably low and uh, for every customer and their inventory has everything that you need. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their how did you hear about us box so that they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your vehicle will ever need. That's rockauto.com. We're joined today on Locked on Tar Heels by Mr. Don Garcia Jr. Always great to have him. We are talking Carolina football recruiting. There's been a flurry of class of 2023 commits in the last week and a half or so, but we want to go all the way back to last August 1st by chance. It's my anniversary. What's up? And the Carolina's first verbal commit is class, and that is four-star quarterback Tad Hudson, who got the ball rolling. John, let's talk about Mr. Tad Hudson. Yeah, kid from Huff High School right in the Charlotte area, one of the premier programs uh, really in the state and in the region uh, on the eastern seaboard. A big, strong quarterback, a recruit. You know, I think he's listed at 6'3", like 215 or so. Yeah. Yeah. And you see it on his tape. I mean, just easy velocity from his right arm, uh, doesn't really have to put a whole lot of body into his throws and, and just pushes it down the field with relative ease, kind of like you would expect from a big pocket yeah. passer uh, type yeah. of quarterback. Um, and I like this kid's demeanor. There's a whole lot of calm in his game. And I think it comes with a lot of experience. You know, he got a lot of run as a high school freshman on varsity at Huff High School, something that probably doesn't happen a whole lot. And then he jumped into full-time starter as a sophomore in junior year. And now he's over 50 touchdowns in his varsity career. He'll push that closer to 100 by the time he's done with the 2022 season. Uh, and you just see that progression that you want with that experience. You know, the touchdowns are up. The completion percentage is up. The yardage is up every single year uh, that, that he's gotten a little bit more experience. So if that trend continues, he's going to have his best year in 2022 as a true pocket passer there is some functional mobility in the okay. pocket he can avoid that first rusher and and keep his eyes down the field but he's not the type of quarterback you're going to design runs for he's more of a pocket big arm quarterback so think of a taller sam howell type although yeah. you're not going to yeah. get some of that tough running right. that right. howell provided as a counter uh to his downfield passing ability um and then what i do think is interesting about tad is not a full-time football player, right? Baseball is, is really big right. in, in his varsity career. I do think he probably is done with the sport as of later this spring. Uh, so I do think he's now going to make that full shift towards focusing on football and quarterbacking 100% of the time. So we could see an even bigger jump because that other sport isn't on his plate. Right. Uh, and I do think that's quite interesting in, in his development and how early he committed I do think probably creates a chip on his shoulder too, right? Because yeah. we talk about, I just came from the Elite 11. Uh, we're talking about all these uncommitted quarterbacks and Arch Manning and Nico Imaliava. Where are they going? What does it mean? This kid committed last year, right? August 1st. So there's he's kind of a forgotten man, although he's a legitimate, yeah. productive blue chip recruit at the quarterback position who, who really does some sniper work from the pocket. I love his downfield ability. He can counter and move his arm angle like you would expect a baseball player to do in the short to intermediate game. Yeah. And he's got enough mobility to, to keep a pass rusher honest uh, and, and to maximize uh, a program's passing game. So a lot of traits that really lean into what North Carolina wants from an explosive plays perspective on offense. Yeah. And they got those guys on the outside to help match that up. Yes. Now, the question is, it's interesting to me, John, that he committed, you know, almost a year ago now. But then just took an official visit a couple weekends ago when Carolina had a ton of dudes on campus. Their biggest recruiting official visit weekend of the summer. Why, why does a recruit choose to do that who's already committed? Well, there's a whole lot of communication between Tad and Mac Brown and the rest of that coaching staff. It's strategic. There's really no other way to put it. Uh, when, mm. when you're a Charlotte kid like he is, you can get over Chapel Hill pretty quickly, right? Uh, so you develop uh, all the, the things you need to be comfortable with the school well in advance, right? And this kid has been visiting probably since the last coaching staff was in town to a degree. <laughs> so I do think familiarity-wise, you don't need to burn that official visit in the spring uh, unless there's a huge recruiting weekend. And obviously that was more geared towards the summer. 
at UNC. And I think peer recruiting is still really critical in building a great recruiting class, especially you just talked about it. Some of these new commitments are receivers. You don't think it helped to have their future quarterback sitting there with them? Absolutely. Like, hey, th- you know, this is this is the state of this is Keenan. This is a uh, timeout. This is where you get your best uh, breakfast sandwich or whatever <laughs> it is. All that stuff matters uh, when you're developing rapport from recruit to recruit, especially on offense. You bring in an offensive lineman and receivers like Carolina has. The quarterback being there matters. So I think that's all strategy <clears throat> from Matt Brown and company at this point to really emphasize like an extension of the coaching staff, right? You yeah, you don't need to yeah. tour him anymore. He's not checking out the academic facilities this time around. He's been there and done that. So I think that's another benefit to recruiting so well in state and regionally is that you bring in prospects who already have checked that box. So now it's about football. It's about recruiting. It's about digging into what really could separate your school from the others, right? All these campuses are nice. The academics is similar at a lot of these schools. So if you can push that aside towards the end of the cycle, now you can have more football time or whatever the kids' interests are. You can spend more of that time uh, with them because you've already been able to host them and, and get visits out of the way. And when it's your quarterback, uh, it's just, again, an extension of the coaching staff. You expect him to want that responsibility. And it sounds like Tad both wanted it and helped execute some <clears throat> uh, verbal commitments there as well. Absolutely. Like with this peer to peer recruiting, um, I mean, he's essentially been the Armando Baycott of the football team. Baycott's always out here just trying to get everybody to come join him in Chapel Hill. And Tad Hudson is very active on Twitter. Any any of the guys that have committed, he quote tweets it. He's out there. Uh, I don't know Rogers ended up going to Ohio State, but he was uh, posting video of the two of them, you know, playing pitch and catch. Uh, at a camp and saying, man, this could be us. And uh, just loved, what, what does it mean to have your quarterback from this class being that big daddy recruiter taking on that mantle? And yeah, hop on board, follow me, boys, I'm leading this charge. It means everything. I mean, there's, it's one thing for, you know, an adult to be, uh, or an aging adult to be telling you about all these great things. And it, it matters. That, that alone, of course, is, is critical. But when it comes from someone who's going through it at that moment, it just hits different. It's just a circumstance that exists. And and if you can take advantage of that, you have a chance to really build a class in short order. And it's not just on visits. I want to make that clear. Peer recruiting is every day. All these kids are in like 50 group chats. So when you commit to Carolina, you're going to get on the group chat led by Tad, I'm sure. And he's going to kind of direct the things. Hey, these are the next guys we need to recruit. Let, let's go push for him. Let's start a hashtag. Whatever it is, you're building externally as, as you look for more talent, but then internally you're building relationships with the current commitments. Because as you know, Isaac, landing the commitment is one thing, uh, but holding on and getting them to sign in December is yeah. a whole different thing in a lot of cases. So you're also maintaining that extension of the coaching staff within the commitment list to hold and lock in some of these top yeah. prospects that you've already successfully landed from a commitment standpoint so it's it's as valuable as possible to have that ambassador be a quarterback be an in-state guy and be a guy who committed early that's like the trifecta that's exactly (laughs) what you want if you can go get it and that's why carolina is going to have a great offensive class in particular in 2023 yeah, I mean, you're spot on there. We we throw the word commit around, but I guess to be more specific and technical, we should be saying verbal commit because they ain't locked in yet, right. and Tad Hudson is trying to help make that a reality. Now, here's a question, John. I want to ask you about the quarterback room because this is the most publicized position in the sport, and I feel like we so often hear um, in, in college teams, we have just loaded quarterback rooms. So Carolina already has Drake May. They've already got Jacoby Criswell. Coming in this year as a freshman is Connor Harrell. And then obviously Tad Hudson will be coming in next year. Why? I mean, you can only play one of these dudes at a time unless you're (laughs) trying to have multiple QBs, which is silly. Like, why is it important for a school to have a quarterback in each class? And ultimately, what happens to the odd man out when it comes to PT? Well, we know what happens to the odd man out. He, he hits the portal <laughs> more times than not. And, and that's why you need to bring in a quarterback in every class. Because obviously, first of all, there's different levels of talent, right? Every class is a little bit different. 
you're, you're in earlier on, on some classes like this one, or maybe you go later in the game, like last year with, with Connor Harrell. Yeah. Um, so you do want to stack different types of quarterbacks. I think Carolina's done a good job of that, right? With, with May, Criswell, Harrell, and, and now Hudson, very different styles of quarterbacks. But yeah, I, I think once this battle shakes out this year and then the pecking order becomes clear, you're, you're going to lose someone. It, it's just the nature of the game. You know, the number used to be two or three. If you get two or three on scholarship, you're in good shape. Now it's like unlimited. As many as you can bring in, you would like to bring in because attrition can happen at any time, at any yeah. point, from any spot. The number two guy could be fed up and think he should have won the job and go somewhere. Or that number three or four guy might be like, well, I have no chance of playing. So I'm, I'm going to be <laughs> proactive about this even before maybe I develop and I'm going to go look to play somewhere else. So you just never know when that attrition is coming. I think that's why so many coaches are not only recruiting a quarterback every year or sometimes two, we're seeing more schools covet two in this 2023 class, but then you're also seeing more programs, I guess, complain about these transfer portal windows because they don't exist. You can go in at any time and I think that's why so many coaches are calling for regulation there, at least yeah. for the calendar, so you can know, okay, August 1st, these guys are locked in. You know, there's not really anybody that could jump into the portal and, and play immediately. You know, you need more parameters through the portal. I think that's the biggest reason why. It's just roster management. We need X amount of scholarship quarterbacks to go into this battle here. Um, and I do think that would create a little bit more comfort at the position, but – I don't think any schools are are going to slow down recruiting as many good quarterbacks as possible. And that means even when you think you've got a good room, you don't ignore the portal. Even no. if you feel good about it, you have to look at that portal because it, especially in the spring, it, it can really shake things up. And you can go from a good starter to a potential great fit and, and a game-changing type of quarterback. So I don't have to explain all the transfers that have had great <laughs> success at their next stop. So. I do think that all of those things factor in, and, and you've got to stack as much quarterback talent as possible. Yeah, LSU's pretty happy about how that turned out, if uh, if we're getting specific. <laughs> right. Exactly. Amongst others, obviously, as you alluded to. Well, uh, from talking about Tad Hudson to two of the young men he's going to be throwing to in 2023 who just committed in the past five days, four or five days, we're going to talk about Christian Hamlin and Chris Culliver right after I tell you about Bilt Bar. From the people who invented healthy and tasty comes the latest gift to your taste buds. You've probably tried the amazing Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar, but guess what? Our friends at Built have given Coconut Brownie Chunk the puffs treatment. That's right, the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar flavor you love in a deliciously chewy marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. It's like a fluffy cloud of chocolate brownie goodness, of coconut brownie goodness as well. But stop drooling and listen, they are good for you. Low calorie, low in sugar, high protein, and all delicious. Coconut brownie chunk puffs are only here for a limited time, so go to Built.com and get yours today. Don't miss out. All Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits just for you. The best part about Built Puffs is, of course, they taste amazing, but you can enjoy them guilt-free because they're actually good for you. These are the perfect treat for whenever you have a craving or you just need to satisfy your sweet tooth, whatever it is, this is there for you with all the protein you need. Delicious coconut rich sweet brownie creamy marshmallow stop fantasizing go to built.com to order your box of coconut brownie chunk built puffs right now and while you're there use promo code locked 15 to get 15 percent off that order again that's promo code locked 15 to get 15 percent off at built.com well, coming out of talking about Tad Hudson, now we got to talk about two of his guys who we throw into on the outside. Two four star, two more in state bets. Christian Hamlin, uh, six foot nothing, 175 in state guy, committed on July 1st. And uh, Chris Culliver, another four star guy, but he's 6'3, 175 in state, committed on Independence Day. And uh, I think, John, we got to start with Christian Hamlin and his commitment switcheroo. Tell us what happened there. Wow. Um, you know, this is this is something that we'll talk about for some time, especially when certain teams play 
in the ACC. Um, so if they stay in the ACC. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Who knows? That's a whole different deal. So <laughs> Christian announces his, his commitment at his press conference to Clemson with a Clemson shirt that he reveals underneath a jacket and then proceeds to put on the Clemson hat. So you kind of look at his parents or whoever's with him and they're kind of like, what is happening there? And then all of a sudden, he takes the hat off, takes the shirt off, and there's certainly a North Carolina logo there underneath. But he even said Clemson University. He never really said North Carolina <laughs> in the ceremony. So there was not only some confusion, there's some gravitas there from Christian to be able to present that to, let's be honest, the, the, the conference's dominant program, the, the apex of, of at least perception in the ACC today. So to go at them, I thought was quite interesting. And look, he's a kid that was recruited by everyone. So you understand that he feels good about where he's at. But to throw that kind of shade, we've seen it in different lights. We've seen fake the hat and then throw it. Um, You know, we've seen launch the hat, certainly. (laughs) But I don't know the last time I saw saying the school, the shirt and the hat only to switch it. So he might have the boldest switch a roo or fake out or 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 any of that 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 we've seen to date so that alone i like it 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 brings a target on his back it it shows his confidence and even some fun along the way nine times out of ten these kids have already committed privately to the coaches i don't know if that's the case here but you hope for his sake that he already had called Dabo and mac brown and let them know what the deal was if not I cannot wait for him to ascend to a starting position and play against those Clemson Tigers because I I promise you that will come up time and time again. Absolutely. Like, man, I just, like, I love it. As a, if I'm Mac Brown, I feel like I've got to have a conversation. Like, even if Mac Brown knew, even if Dabo knew, I feel like at some point I've got to have a conversation with him to say, hey, I love your moxie. I love what you're doing here. Bro, you got to be careful because those Clemson D backs are going to be coming for you, homie. Absolutely, there's no doubt. And and he's he's by doing that, he's telling the the football world that I am ready for all of that. Uh, and that you know you got to back it up. You talk the talk, you got to walk it. Uh, so we'll see in that regard. But look, he's a heck of a player, extremely productive uh, out of Harrisburg. Um, really like his inside out game. He can factor in the return game as well. And then I think. The other one is is it's more conventional, six three, longer, yep. but man, crazy production. I think he had like twenty six touchdowns. Culver <laughs> yeah, did. That's insane. As a junior, I mean, unbelievable production. Both of these guys, I think, combined, it's like twenty five hundred yards and thirty plus touchdowns. I mean, that's a lot of production. I don't care who you're playing against. That's a <laughs> lot of production on the outside, and and that's what North Carolina has become as wide receiver recruiters. They bring in guys that are productive and ready to go right now. And these two kind of complement each other from a height, weight, standpoint. Exactly. So I like that variance as well. Yeah, and you mentioned that that in-state stuff. I mean, it's just, here we go again, all over, just keeping the in-state higher-ranked guys at North Carolina – I just it just keeps happening. Last in the this class, the 2022 class, two more four star in state wide receiver. Like it's just you keep replacing the coffers. You see what Josh is doing inside. You see what the outside guys are doing a couple years ago. Come be part of that, right? A hundred percent. It's it's so translatable. We're, we're seeing schools overhaul that room wide receiver in particular. That positional grouping and room has been overhauled easier to me than just about any other position nationally. We see it at Alabama, certainly at Ohio State, Oklahoma under Lincoln Riley. It's it's a cycle that is easily replaceable or, or, or able to duplicate. And I do think that there's a reason for it. These receivers come in more polished, more experienced and productive th- than they had prior. There's not a whole lot of developing, at least – to get them on the football field. And I think that's advantageous for the program that, you know, want to spin it like, like Carolina does. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and for these guys, I mean, obviously they know their their second fiddle to Noah Rogers. But Carolina loses him a couple weeks ago, and then you know what what does that do for you as a receiver? Especially you know we talked about Christian Ham- Hamlin and the moxie he has, Chris Culliver, and all this crazy production. It's like, all right, Rogers is out. I'm going to grab that spot. Is that like where where does their brain process that as they see somebody higher level commit in front of them? Yeah, there's no doubt that becomes a part of it. Um, look, it's it's a numbers game, right? There's only one ball. You know, even <laughs> if the most pass-happy offenses, you're talking 40, 45 attempts a game, most of those are, are completions. So you're talking, let's say, 35 completions a game. You start doing the numbers, and then all of a sudden it trickles down, and, and you've got to – make a smart choice, not only the emotional one. Yeah. Um, and I do think, uh, again, you know, that opens the door for Carolina. And, and this happens every year, right? Every program has a board and then it changes. Um, so you've got to be able to react when it doesn't go your way. So to have three receivers already on board, even though one of them's not Noah Rogers, is about where you want to be from a North Carolina standpoint uh, as of, you know, July 6th or 7th, uh, 2022. Love that. Well, we've got a ton more guys, obviously, that have recently committed. We're going to have to talk about them next week because we're all out of time for this week. John Garcia, as always, thank you so much for all your wisdom and great insight. Thank you also to LinkedIn for sponsoring this segment. Thanks for having me, Isaac. That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks so much for John Garcia to helping us start to unpack what it means to have added all these recruits lately, to start talking about a few of them, and then we'll unpack more on next week's show. Coming up tomorrow, an interview with John Minadakis. Who is that? He's the co-owner of Jimmy's Famous Seafood. You've probably seen their tweets all over social media. They are big Tar Heels fans, and that's why John is on the show. He's going to tell us all about it and their great company and how they uh, take care of people and take care of their community. Thanks so much for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button, and comment as you listen or later on. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow John Garcia at Garcia Locked on and follow me at Isaac Shade. Get more on the ACC by making Locked on ACC your second listen today. Host Candace Cooper and the local experts of Locked On take you across the ACC in 30 minutes, five days a week. Thanks so much for spending part of your Thursday hanging out with me, hanging out with John Garcia, talking about what's going to be in the years ahead for the Carolina football team. As for now, I want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace!